Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Lewis. I'm the director of the journalism program here at York. Uh, this is part of the ongoing enrichment uh, series uh, in journalism that we provide as part of the program. The idea is to try and hit the kinds of topics and situations in journalism and media that's hard to cover the way we would like to in the classroom. So we try to bring in some of the top people in the field to give you uh, other perspectives on what's going on and a sense of what's really important in journalism and media, sort of in real time uh, as we move, move forward. Uh, today we have an incredible uh, group of people on the panel and we will be bringing in another top journalist uh, through Skype from Los Angeles. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Tom Moore, who's going to be the moderator for this, and he'll introduce our panel. Thank you for coming. For our director, Glenn Lewis, thank you very much. Our general, our commander. I also want to make sure we say hello to the chair of the English department. Dr. Linda Grasso is here as part of the audience and also as one of our guests today. So thank you for coming in. I appreciate it. I, I really appreciate it. So, uh, I, w I was thinking about uh, how to really get this going, and I have been so overwhelmed with the articles I've read and the documentaries I've watched that I'm going to keep it painfully short with a quick introduction and talk about the different areas we're going to delve into, how we're going to talk about what this age of surveillance, what the Snowden, Edward Snowden, the guy who worked for the NSA, what it, what it means, all the documents that he stole because he felt like they offended him as an American, that so, many of, so much of our private communication was being grabbed by the government. Uh, we'll get into finer points on that in a few minutes because the experts here will be able to really tell us what's, what they think is going on and what the implications are. The implications are the key. Implications for journalists. If you decide to report on government, and, and what are the obstacles up against you if you want to do some investigative work when there are these, when we're living in what is more than ever a surveillance state where the government is, feels like it may be at war trying to defend us from uh, enemy, enemies out there. And the second issue is much bigger. It's not just as journalists, if you're reporting or you're trying to keep your sources secret. The other issue is much wider. What does it mean for us as citizens? because it, it's a violation of our constitutional rights to be spied on, or as, as the, our guest on the screen, Bob Shear, says in his book, to be, um, uh, what was the term, in, Bob, what was the term in your subtitle? Snooped. Oh, the state is snooping on us. I think he said snooping on us. So let me do a quick introduction. That's my ham-handed uh, way of, of telling you about the topic, what it means for us as citizens to be in a surveillance state, and what it means for us as journalists also, whether you're reporting on it, or if you're trying to keep your sources and your information, uh, your sources secret. So a quick introduction, starting from uh, on my right, your left, Jesse Holcomb is with Pew, the Pew Research Foundation, where he's a senior researcher. Back uh, last month, they rolled out a study that perfectly fits this topic in the post-Snowden era, what it means for journalism, journalists working in this time of government surveillance. He'll outline what that survey and that research found. They rolled it out, they launched it at a very big Columbia Journalism School event down in Washington. So really glad you're here, Jesse. Hello. <laughs> Next to Jesse, we have Edmund Lee. Edmund Lee is from Recode, and Recode is a uh, technology website that has so much news, I can't call it a technology website. It's more of a news website that specializes in tech, very big tech questions. He's managing editor, and we're very happy to have him here also. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that here he has a name tag. Robert Shear is on the screen. He can hear me. The microphone is being picked up all the way over there. Robert Shear is from Los Angeles, and he is joining us from his living room in living color. Uh, Bob, thanks very much for joining us. Yep. There, it's working. Great. Uh, now, Bob is uh, editor of a, 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 a Webby award-winning website called truthdig.com. He's co-host of Public Radio's Left, Right, and Center which is nationally syndicated, and he's also a journalism professor at USC, University of Southern California. He pointed out to me, he's been reporting on these kind of issues since the 90s. So it's been a while, he's a, and he's got a brand new book out on this topic, uh, which I will correctly uh, uh, tell you about. It's uh, title, They Know Everything About You. I got it, Bob. Uh, they Know Everything About You, <laughs> How Data Collecting corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. Brand new book, 
right on this topic. So welcome from Los Angeles. <laughs> yes, good idea. And then la last but not least, we have Tom Robbins, who just did a front page story on uh, guards at Attica. And uh, it was in conjunction with the Marshall Project, which I'll tell you about. But it really does specialize in what's happening in the US uh, uh, correction system, correct? Yes. And the, the managing editor of the New York Times, Keller, Bill Keller, m former managing editor, right? leaves and goes right to Marshall. So it's a big organization that you may not have heard of, but get it on your radar as journalism majors, definitely. So, so much for my introductions. I have a technological concern about our connection to LA, so I'd like to start off by asking Robert Shear, Bob for all of us, because we're here in this room together having this wonderful meeting, to start us off with what's going on on this front, a wide open question about government surveillance. Bob, on two fronts, not just for not just for, he can see me now, Ju not just for journalists, but also the bigger question for citizens. How would you attack that far too wide of a question? Okay, the, the big contradiction uh, is that the thing that is destroying newspapers, the internet, and we should be clear about it, uh, the business model of newspapers and broadcast television has been destroyed by the internet. And the reason the internet has been able to destroy it is it provides an advertising uh, form or access that is a killer app. Uh, traditional newspapers and broadcast television would estimate their readers, they would try to do demographic breakdowns, uh, but basically they could not uh, accurately define who was reading their paper or, or watching television, or what part of the show they were watching, and certainly not whether they went on to buy anything. And yet this advertising was sold on the basis of that. The internet has one big thing going for it economically, and it's the main thing. It's the driver of profit. It's responsible for 98% of Google's profit, but it's true of all the big companies, and that's targeted advertising. And targeted advertising is really a, a way of saying invading your privacy. And so all of your movements, your keystrokes, everything you do, your chats, your purchases, how far you read into a book, what movie you go to, who you have dinner with, all of this information is combined with an increasing sophistication on the internet because of supercomputers, because of the ability to go through all this data, but also the willingness, that's the key, the willingness of people who are not really the customers, they're the marks, they're the target, but you're not paying for Gmail, you're not paying for most of what you get on the internet, so you're not really customers. The customers are the people who want to sell you stuff. And so the internet, uh, and I know this, I've been an editor on an internet publication now for 10 years, and we, we have a great ride, but I know how difficult it is to support journalism on the internet unless you have the enormous, you know, uh, uh, tens of millions of, of eyeballs out there. And the reason the internet is such a powerful economic model is precisely because it can invade your privacy with an effectiveness that no dictator could have ever dreamed of. And Orwell and Huxley couldn't dream of it in Brave New World or, or 1984. And so what this means is that the people running the internet uh, have unleashed a, a monster, really. It's also a great, great tool for educating people, for uniting. We know all that. And precisely because it's a great tool for educating and uniting people and exchanging information, people voluntarily give up this information. But in the process, we've come to define freedom as basically the freedom to shop, uh, to pick a restaurant, to go to the movie you want to go to, and in return, we give up our location, we give up now with the Apple uh, I6 phone, we give up our thumbprint uh, maybe 40, 50 times a day, and we give government everywhere, and this is the rub, not just private corporations, but what Edward Snowden revealed is that what might have otherwise been accepted as a private arrangement between a customer and the corporation said you and Google was not a private transaction. It did not stay in the private sector. It is not primarily a consumer decision because, and Snowden was not the first to reveal aspects, but the uh, 
breadth of, of what he revealed was so devastating uh, that as a result, we know that this information is available not only to our own government, but governments throughout the world. Thank you. And as a result, you have now the ultimate totalitarian model. You can know you don't park outside someone's house or just wiretap. You know where they are. And then let me just conclude by saying this is a violation. As the Roberts Court has acknowledged in its uh, uh, unanimous decision this year, uh, last year, on cell phone privacy, this is a gross violation of the Fourth Amendment of the United States uh, Constitution. And as Roberts, a conservative uh, justice, pointed out, it's a violation of the basic tenet of the Constitution, which is the sovereignty of the individual, sovereignty against the King of England in common law, English common law for hundreds of years, and certainly put into the foundational document of our society that your information uh, is private and sacred to you and could not be intruded. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Uh, let me, let me, uh, in these introductory comments, in these introductory comments, we just heard from uh, Los Angeles and Bob Shear. Let me shift it right over to Recodes, Edmund Lee, because I have two snippets from one of your recent articles on your website. I don't believe it was your byline. Whoever was assigned to go with the big boss to the White House, then they assigned a print reporter to write it up for the website. Uh, you, you do notice I, that comment? I edited it. You edited it. it. Of course, you're managing editor. Here we go. Like from editor. Recode. And make a note of that, please. Look it up. It's an amazing website. Um, uh, first, an introduction who we're talking about. In both of my classes, I'm asking everybody to research Snowden upside down and sideways, but we're talking about a former National Security uh, Agency contractor, Edward Snowden, releasing a huge amount of internal government documents beginning back in 2013. There's stories now that his lawyers are working on the possibility of him coming back from, where is he hiding? Where is he? Russia, he's in Moscow, okay. Uh, he might come back if they give him a Petraeus deal. I can't get into that, but if they, if they make sure, no death penalty, please. Please. Um, so I'm not going to digress on that. Back in 2013, he stole all these documents because it made him so upset, um, releasing this, uh, revealing a, a secret surveillance program. And uh, this, is a, this is right off your website that was sucking user data from tech companies. Now listen to what the president said during a face-to-face -face interview with, with uh, the website that, uh, that Edmund works for. Uh, quoting the president, from the article, in the case of the NSA, we were probably a little slow, out of context, and not slow on knowing how wide the net was, I'm not sure. Slow. What we did, again, this is Obama speaking, what we did with the respect to US persons in this country was strictly circumscribed. Circumscribed. Was it really limited? Was it really careful? Was strictly circumcised. Generally speaking, Obama says, I can say with almost complete confidence that there have not been abuses on US soil or cyberspace, not necessarily soil. So let me turn it to you, Edmund. That was a quick sample of the Obama interview, but the bigger question is, how would you introduce this topic to the crowd as journalism issue and also a constitutional issue for all, everybody here in the US? Well, so I'm not a constitutional expert. Um, I think there are very few actual constitutional experts, but I think the way Bob framed it up front is a pretty good way of looking at it, which is, the reason why the government, the NSA, or whomever uh, is interested in looking at all these communications, you know, what you're saying to your friends or to your family or to your employers or your co fellow colleagues is that's how we live now. You know, the, the freedom to assemble, which is part of the Constitution, which is a big part of how the country is founded, you know, is an important right that was literally, you know, you, you physically assembled. You said, hey, where are you? Let's go meet, let's discuss revolution, whatever it might be. Um, nowadays, it's happening all online, right? So uh, sometimes, you know, the, this freedom to assemble is, you know, there could be terrorists, homegrown terrorists, or there could be uh, foreign invaders uh, trying to assemble and figure out what's going on. And so therefore, they're like, well, we need to be where people are. So once upon a time, and they still do this, whether it's the FBI or the NSA or the CIA, they would actually have people on the ground, on the street, looking, you know, trying to infiltrate these groups. The way they're doing it now is by, you know, snooping on your your electronic communications, and so because it's become such a necessary medium, and because it's being developed by corporations because of advertising and, and the need to sell things, that's where everyone is today. And so, therefore, as a result of that, 
that's where the NSA and the CIA, all these guys feel like they need to be. Now, the issue, constitutionally speaking, is do they have the right to do that, right? Um, it used to be, and it still supposed to be, supposedly is, if a law enforcement agency wants to know what's being said between persons A and person B, they'd have to get a court order. A, court, a judge would have to deem this, uh, there, there's a probable cause for taking a closer look at what these guys are saying to each other based on other evidence. Apparently what Snowden found is that actually they're not, they're not going to any judge to get this information. In fact, they're just vacuuming up all the communication that's out there, and then after the fact, looking back into it and saying, hey, we now have the right to look at this, and so therefore, you know, it gets to be sort of like a, a there's a lot of nuance in the, in the legal issues. I think if you just look at the bare face of it, it doesn't look pretty kosher to me. Um, and what Obama said to us, which I don't know if you guys believe it or not, and he said this in the past, is, well, we haven't broken any laws. I think that's part of the issue, though. What is the law? What are the rights? And I think to kind of try to involve you guys a little bit more. I think whether it's your generation or my generation or, or others, it's funny how different generations perceive privacy. Um, my generation in particular, I was you know, born in the 70s and grew up in the 80s and 90s. You know, we, privacy is, a, is an absolute right. There's no question about it. I don't want you to know what I've written in my diary entry. I don't want you to know who I've talked to, who I hang out with, unless I explicitly allow for it. I tend to see a lot of younger people these days not care as much, whether they're on Facebook or Snapchat or whatever it is, and they're, they're free to just sort of talk about whatever's in their head and, and what they've been doing. And I, get, I could be completely wrong about this, but I'd be curious to know what you guys, how you guys respond. I mean, do you care about whether the government or a, another corporation is quote unquote spying on you? Does it matter to you whether they know where you, what you ate and who you were hanging out with or what you're even thinking about a particular situation? Raise your hands if that concerns you at all. I'm just curious. Do you care that you're giving yeah. up your location, where you're shopping? Okay, so maybe about half of you, a little more than half of you. Um, so clearly it matters to you, and so therefore, you know, this is something you should pay close attention to, not just as budding journalists, but just as citizens of the country, right? Uh, if you don't want the government or, frankly, corporations or any, you know, looking at what you're doing without your explicit consent, should pay close attention to how they're interpreting the law or how they're legislating what the law should be in these regards because that has a profound effect on how you live but also how journalists can function and we can delve a bit more into that later on but thank you yeah. let's switch over to jesse uh, jesse holcomb from pew research and uh, the study that i referred to that came out just last month really says it all it was about investigative journalists and digital security so jesse you've already got a feeling for how we're introducing this topic there's a uh, thousand copies that are available for ten bucks each. After <laughs> we can also buy Bob Shear's book. It's out there now. Uh, Jesse, tackle it how you wish. Uh, a constitutional issue, a journalistic issue. Probably want to start with journalism. Sure. Uh, so at the Pew Research Center, we uh, we try to tackle some of the big questions facing our times by asking people what they think, what they do. Uh, how they're responding to some of these major trends or events. Uh, what happened with the Snowden documents represented for us a very profound moment in thinking about how uh, the journalism community was going to respond, uh, how they were maybe going to change their behaviors or not change their behaviors in light of what we learned after those uh, reports came out. So the center itself has done a lot of work uh, surveying the public about their attitudes, about privacy, about these kinds of concerns. What we decided to do was uh, ask a group of investigative journalists. Uh, before I talk about some of that research, I'll just briefly set the context with what we've learned in some of our surveys of the general public uh, about their attitudes, about privacy, about surveillance, and these kinds of concerns. I would say that there's really, uh, our, our research has found that there's really a universal feeling among the American public at large that we're just not in control of our personal information. 91% uh, of the US public in a recent survey said they feel they've lost control over how their personal information is used and collected by companies. 80% uh, of adults uh, feel that Americans should be concerned about the government's monitoring of phone calls and internet communications. Uh, 
if you're in survey research like we are, you don't always see big numbers like that. So this is, uh, these are the kinds of concerns that just are kind of the air we breathe. Uh, so we surveyed journalists, uh, a group of investigative journalists, to ask them about these things. We wanted to know whether they've changed their practices in light of what we know about the Snowden revelations, whether they're concerned as well. Uh, so we surveyed uh, nearly 700 uh, members of a group called the Investigative Reporters and Editors, uh, which is a, uh, they were great collaborators, uh, and if you're a journalism student, they're a good group to know. They've got an annual conference. Uh, they've got one coming up in Philadelphia this year, and we did this in partnership with the Tau Center for Digital Journalism based out of Columbia University. And while I mentioned that, another useful tool for uh, journalism students and others who are interested in this is a publication uh, that comes out of the Tau Center. I think it's called the uh, Digital Security Handbook for Journalists, something to that effect. It's by Susan McGregor. And uh, it's just a very practical guide for helping uh, journalists and students understand how the internet works. I think there's a lot uh, here that involves education, understanding what happens uh, once you click send, once you press a button, uh, what, you know, what's the role of servers, what's the, you know, what happens on your mobile device. Uh, so it's a real useful, straightforward guide, so I'd encourage you to look at that uh, as, as a resource. Our survey found that uh, the, these investigative journalists are operating under the assumption that they're being watched as well. We found that about two-thirds of investigative journalists think that the government has probably collected their data. Uh, and we found this especially among journalists who cover national security, federal government, uh, and foreign affairs. Just a whopping 2% of uh, investigative journalists think that their ISP, their internet service provider, can protect their data from being accessed by unauthorized parties. Now, these are what journalists think. Now, regardless of how true this is or not, the perception matters because part of the theory here is that if you think that you're being watched, if you think that your data is being collected, that might influence your behavior. And people call this a chilling effect, right? Uh, uh, so we wanted to know whether these kinds of perceptions are influencing the way that journalists com communicate with sources, with each other, the way they deal with documents and, and the way that they conduct their, their journalism. Uh, and, and so far, uh, what we found in the survey was that uh, in terms of total numbers, relatively few of the journalists we surveyed say that uh, these kinds of concerns have had a direct impact on their practice of journalism. 14% uh, of the journalists we, we surveyed, so a little bit more than one in 10, say that in the past year, concerns about surveillance have either kept them from pursuing a story, uh, have kept them from reaching out to a source, uh, or have led them to consider leaving investigative journalism altogether. 14%. Now, depending on your point of view, that's either a big number or it's a small number. Um, but it is a kind of documentation that there has been some impact about these concerns on the practice of investigative journalism. In terms of numbers, not huge. 12% um, of people who identify as reporters, so not editors or, uh, or producers or, uh, or folks you know, elsewhere in the organization, 12% say it's gotten harder to find a source willing to speak off the record in the past year. And our report has a number of other data points and numbers related to uh, these kinds of uh, documented changes what you might call a chilling effect. Uh, the result of this, so large perception that, that journalists are being watched, little direct evidence of an actual uh, chilling effect, it means that these journalists are sort of taking a middle ground in terms of how they respond. Uh, because some of these uh, techniques that a person or a journalist can take to protect their communications, some of them are really easy to do, some of them are kind of hard to do. Uh, so if you, you know, you know, if you think that you know this is going to have a big effect on you know your journalism or your your life or whatever, you might be willing to take you know, invest more time, you know, spend more time you know, applying some of these technologies like encryption. If you don't think it's that big of a deal, you might you know spend less time. We found that about half of the journalists we surveyed say they've changed the way that they store or share documents in the past year. So that's actually a pretty big number, I thought. I was surprised by that. 
uh, just in the past year alone. So, you know, that sort of lends one to think that some of the news uh, coming out of the Snowden revelations has perhaps had an impact on the way journalists are storing their information. We found that 38% uh, uh, of reporters have changed the way that they communicate with sources. Uh, that journalist source relationship is, uh, is a precious one. It, it, it often needs to be a very secure one, especially for sensitive kinds of stories. Um, one thing that's interesting is that uh, the way they've changed those kinds of uh, communications with sources has less to do with encryption, so less, less about voice and email encryption, more to do with uh, perhaps uh, meeting in person. So some old-fashioned techniques uh, are, are being applied in, in the interest of secure communications. Um, one of the issues uh, here with these news organizations and journalists is that of training. Uh, uh, newsroom resources and the economics of journalism that were mentioned earlier in this conversation uh, are kind of uh, the elephant in the room for journalism organizations around the country. Uh, Almost every journalist we surveyed said that the biggest concern they have about, uh, about journalism is the economics of it. You know, uh, is my newsroom going to have a budget? Um, but these kinds of economic concerns about journalism impact uh, security and, and protection of sources and communications as well. They influence the ability of journalists to get training in their newsrooms. 41% uh, said they've gotten some kind of training. Only, I, if I recall right, it's certainly fewer than 10% say they got training in J school or in college. So uh, what you're learning about here today uh, is something that the, the vast majority of investigative journalists said they have not gotten uh, in, in journalism education. Uh, most people who are sort of studying this stuff as, on the side, they're doing it on their own. Uh, they're trying to sort of learn things as they go along. Uh, so, uh, I've thrown a bunch of numbers at you, happy to share more in our, uh, some Q&A or conversation, but the bigger takeaway here is that uh, both among the public, among investigative journalists, is that uh, the perception and or the reality of surveillance climate has become a, just a feature of modern life. Uh, it, it's how we live. The response in the journalism community is largely what I'd call workarounds and adjustments, trying to respond in certain ways to that. Uh, but there's relatively little outright resistance uh, to these kinds of concerns. So, uh, you know, there's this kind of gulf between the perception and then the reality of what it takes to protect oneself, to protect one's sources. And I'll leave it at that. Jesse, thank you very much. So uh, last but not least, we hear from Tom Robbins from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, who wants to make a few introductory comments also. Well, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a local guy. I, I spend my whole career reporting about just the five boroughs, New York. You know, I, I don't even get to New Jersey too often, you know. But, I, but I, I thought that there's a couple of points I might make, and then, you know, we'll get back to the eminent Bob Shear here, who I think has probably a whole lot more he could say about this, but just as an historical reference point for a couple of them. When, when I worked at the Daily News with your great professor, Claire Sarant, back here, I remember working on a story about when Rudy Giuliani was mayor. And this was an investigative story which had to do with some skullduggery that his administration was up to. We ran a big front page story about the fact that his administration had literally given away all of the child care vouchers, believe it or not, to one of his key political supporters in Brooklyn. And that key, su key political supporter had turned around and uh, charged people for filling out the applications to get those child care vouchers. This was crucial stuff. It was being denied to different neighborhoods. It was the City Hall went nuts. Rudy Giuliani's office denounced it, said it was an irresponsible story. One of my sources in that story was a guy, he's deceased now, so I can talk about him a little bit openly, was a former New York City police detective who I had known for a while. You know, we had a good relationship. I had his, I had a mobile phone then, so did he. This is about 1995. And I would call him on a regular basis. And after my story ran, this fellow called me up 
from a line that I'd never seen. He said, do not call me anymore. He said, what did I do? <laughs> I'm sorry, did I offend you in some way? And he says, I know what they're doing. And I said, well, what do you mean what they're doing? And he says, I used to work for Intel. I said, what do you mean Intel? He said, you know, the intelligence division for NYPD. And when Koch wanted us to find out who the reporters were talking to, we used to listen to your phones. We'd tap your phones. I said, no, you can't do that. You need a warrant to do that. You can't just tap. He said, listen, don't call me anymore. I know what I'm talking about. I will not answer any calls. Here's a number you can get me on. And he gave me a number. It wasn't his home number. It wasn't his cell number. I don't know what it was. Actually, it was a pastor. <clears throat> and I talked to a couple other cops so just to get a reality check to find out, well, gee, were they really doing that stuff? You know, and they just laughed. And they said, yeah, you know, they do what they can get away with. So just, you know, just a historical reference point. What we're seeing now is probably, as, as both Ed and Jesse and, and Bob Shear of Elkhorn described to you, it's easier to do this stuff than it ever was before. But it's not new. It's been going on for a very long time. And I, I threw out this other one word to you, and Bob Shear could describe it to you much more eloquently than I could. But write it down and do your own homework. Co-IntelPro. C-O-I, Counterintelligence Program, C-O-I-N-T-E-L-P-R-O. -E if we have time for this little dog and pony show, I was going to show you about a story I worked on, which has less, than, less to do with surveillance as it has to do with official lying and cover-up. I'll show you an old FBI memo, which I show my students over at CUNY J School. But write that down, because as bad as it is now, I would submit, in my humble 65 plus year old estimation. I don't think we're as bad off as we were when they were doing COINTEL Pro. So why don't we get why don't we get Bob Shear in on that and some other folks? And if you've got time, I'll, I'll give you my story about my own experience with the NYPD recently and their lying and cover up on another story. Uh, Bob, uh, Tom just tossed it to you and wanted to see if you would like to follow up. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. And you were listening to Tom's comments about um, all the way back to Giuliani and Koch and COINTELPRO? Yeah, you've got to stop worrying about this technology. This is how we do our editorial meetings all the time. Uh, one of my reporters is in Portugal right now and you know another in New York, and we did this earlier this morning. So it works. It's a good sign to the internet. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so let's try. Let's... I'm trying to be upbeat. <laughs> you got a good, you got a good laugh. You can't hear it though. It's a nice kind of. Let me give you, let me give you my response to what I've heard. Uh, you know, I, I want to respond to what Tom just said. And by the way, I, I, I love his reporting, and I, I, I think the fact that there is still great reporting is very inspiring, and the Attica story is an example of that. Uh, and we've had very good reporting. In the old media, we have it on, on, on the internet. So I, I don't think journalism is dead. What may be dead is making a living at it. Uh, you know, and that, that may be depressing to your students. But if you get Not a good story, <laughs> it's read all over the world. And I don't even care where it's, it runs. Uh, and you may not be able to pay your rent, but you may find yourself having millions of people reading it. It can go viral, it can have change social policy. So it's an interesting contradiction. We're at a time when it's probably more exciting to be, not probably, it is more exciting to be a journalist now than ever in terms of your reach, in terms of your ability to read original documents, to get information, to get information from all over the world, to, you know, uh, uh, unmask lying and deceit. It has one big problem, which is the economic problem that I brought up before. However, I want to address something Tom just said about the old days and now. He's absolutely right. We had the, the motives of government were no better then than now. They want to make themselves look good. First of all, let's, let's be clear about one thing. Uh, and I'm not happy. I, I think the Pew research is really important because it's the first research to show the public cares. Okay, That 90% figure is very important. I've used it myself in, in writing. However, uh, when the public cares, what the founders do is that that does not lead to an expression of freedom. The whole point of Brave New World in 1984, which I hope the students have read, is self-censorship. It's lulling people into acceptance. And, and when people think they're being watched, 
that. I've been in totalitarian, overtly totalitarian countries. I've covered, you know, the old Soviet Union. I've covered plenty of places. And the fact of the matter is, uh, people develop habits of caution and fear, and, and that includes powerful people. And uh, that's why our government is cracked down on the whistleblowers under, uh, amazingly enough, a constitutional law professor, Barack Obama, has done more damage uh, to our freedom in this regard than any previous president because he has gone after as many whistleblowers as all previous presidents combined under the Espionage Act. And, and it's intimidating. And, and in terms of revealing classified information, one thing the journalists uh, know very well who've covered Washington is a great percentage of our information about foreign affairs, national security, is classified and is routinely leaked in violation of existing law to journalists. Routinely. Okay? Uh, the government loves leaks as long as it makes the government look good for that portion of the government look good. What Edward Snowden's crime is, he revealed data that didn't make the government look good. That was embarrassing. It's that kind of leak that they want to crush. But routinely, people give you information they're not supposed to give you if it supports their case, whether they're in the private sector or government. And we should be clear about that. Secondly, in terms of the good old days or the bad old days, you know, you've got the movie Selma out now. And as you know, the subtext in Selma was that J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, went out to destroy Martin Luther King. And he wanted to destroy Martin Luther King because he thought that the civil rights as interpreted by Martin Luther King was dangerous to the country. Uh, Hoover was out of his mind at that point and a very dangerous figure. Yet he was in charge of our major national security organization. And he was able through old fashioned means, uh, phone taps and so forth, to get personal information on King and try deliberately uh, to drive him to suicide and to ruin him as a public figure, to blackmail him. Now let me tell you, with today's technology, uh, Martin Luther King would have been destroyed. With today's technology, uh, even lower level officials within that bureaucracy have an act, just think, people in the class, what ramblings have you said? Did you go see the movie Fifty Shades of Grey? Did you have any thoughts about it? Did you communicate that to anyone? Did it inspire you maybe to look at similar literature or take out similar movies? And then think of the profile that could be developed about any one of you. And then if somebody wanted to destroy you and destroy your friends and show you what you're up to, whether it was because you were involved in the Occupy movement or maybe you're trying to organize opposition to our getting into other wars or something, the, the whole notion of our Constitution, which you must address if you're going to deal with this issue, is the notion of limited government. It is not the public, this haystack that they're gathering information on, that's supposed to be viewed with suspicion. It is the government that is. That's the whole meaning of our constitutional separation of powers, you know, limited government, uh, checks and balances, and of course the Bill of Rights. That's the key point. After 9-11, they turned it on its head. They said everyone in the world is a potential terrorist, and the government has the right to gather this haystack of information, a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment, which is a ban on general warrants. You have to observe due process. You have to have a specific reason for investigating. That's why the police, thanks to the Roberts Court, can not just invade your smartphone. Uh, and the whole principle of it, which, which should be discussed, is that, and mind you, the people who gave us these protections were going to be the government. And they were going to be the government in a time that was much more frightening than after 9-11, which is the big excuse. You know, we are the strongest military power in the world with the biggest, strongest, most stable economy. And to say that America after 9-11 provided an excuse for destroying freedom is utter nonsense. The founders of our country, the framers of the Constitution, were living in a far more insecure time. And they were going to be the government. And they enshrined these protections in the free press, free assembly, etc., and said, you're going to have to watch us. Why? Because power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we want to have a representative government here. We don't want to have a monarchy. And so they took these principles and enshrined them in the Constitution. And yet after 9-11, our government, and it continued right up through Bush and into Obama, said, oh, 9-11 changed everything. We can no, freedom is now an indulgence. 
No, the founders of our Constitution said freedom is not an indulgence that we had in the safest times. Freedom is a necessity to prevent government corruption and to have honest and intelligent administration. That's why you have a free press. So that is the argument you should be addressing uh, in this class. Uh, you know, what is the significance of this tradition that is being destroyed? Bob, thank you. Um, there, there are so many, um, there's so many historical, political uh, things, current day, as well as it, he went back in his history all the way to the Revolutionary War era. But of course, uh, what do you think I zeroed in on? I'm going to go backwards, okay? And then we'll get to follow up on some of what Bob just said. But when it comes to a job with some pay, Bob, when it comes to a job in today's journalism world and some pay, Edmund, we get a rock star from the Wall Street Journal like Walter Walt Mossberg, who starts his own website. Other people have done it, like the stars from the Washington Post who started Politico. How about that as a, oh, there are jobs. When people see, I know the Washington Post example a little better. They advise the Post to take some steps so they could have a strong web operation, a strong dot-com news gathering organization, and they weren't moving quickly enough. Yeah, well, the Post basically turned them down. They turned so them the, down. Two guys so, who ahead. started I think Politico. You got my question. All right, it's a good, it's a good, and I think it's a, it's a point that Bob's been bringing up in terms of the economics of news gathering, and I think you know w w the Pew Pew data also sort of points out that a lot of newsrooms aren't getting the resources, which is effectively money for training for 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 tool sets, whatever it might be. A little bit uh, of example, Politico, if you guys are familiar with, is a, a, a blog website, news site focused on DC about policy. Uh, it's gained a lot of traction in DC and in a lot of ways has overtaken the Washington Post as, as a, a regular everyday read for people of DC. And when I say people of DC, I mean your representatives, right? People who run the government. Um, and the two guys who started it were these young guys uh, at, the, at the Post who said, you know what, we should have like a blog. Um, and they went to uh, Don Graham, at the, who at the time still owned the Post, as a Graham family, and he thought it was a neat, neat idea, and they, he asked them how much money they wanted, and he, they told him, and he said, no, I can't spend that money, money on an unproven website. Um, and, you know, they basically went to a different guy who had a lot of money and said, here, let's go do it, and they started Politico, and everyone thought, oh, this is crazy, there's no way this town's going to support this other random blog. Uh, but nowadays, you know, they're, from what I understand, profitable or just barely profitable, um, and uh, they've got a large operation with a large staff. The difference, though, is this. At the time, the, the height of newspapers, whether it's the New York Times or the Post or the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, um, the economics of newspapers were such that profit margins were really high. Basically, for the amount of money they spent on their newsroom, meaning paying reporters and editors and having a newsroom and all that kind of stuff, paled in comparison to how much money they got in advertising. Advertising paid for that and then some, right? Um, when you go online, whether it's Politico or a site like Gawker, or you've heard of, I'm sure, BuzzFeed now, right? You're all probably on these sites. Yes, they're profitable, but just barely. In other words, the amount of money they're spending for ha to have a staff, and the staff isn't, by comparison, as well compensated as the staffs of the New York Times and the Washington Post were 20 years ago, say, relatively speaking. After all that, there's some money left over, but not a lot. And the reason for that is because advertising online gets much, it just generates far less dollars than it did in print. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and I think Bob pointed out earlier, which is, ironically, advertising online has, has the ability to be tracked, meaning I know how many people actually saw it, how many clicked on it, how many people bothered to end up paying for my product after I have advertised, and so now I know the real value of my advertising, right? Not only that, you, a lot of you guys, I'm sure, just start ignoring it. You're not clicking on these things, you're barely looking at them. So if the publisher is getting paid by how many people are, are, are looking at these ads or clicking on them or, or diving into them, they're only gonna get paid based on what, you know, the, the, pub, the advertiser can track. And so it's tracked, they're tracking you, they're paying publishers, but not nearly as much. And the cycle continues because then, these, uh, you know, these newsrooms, the sort of the next day newsrooms, whether it's BuzzFeed or Gawker, who knows what comes down the line, um, they just don't have the manpower to do investigative deep reporting. And what I mean by that is this, is that I've seen these newsrooms, I've, I've worked in these rooms, these blog newsrooms, and like reporters are responsible for a lot of content, a lot of articles within a given day, within a given time frame. 
you know, the guys over at Gawker, they're paid on a, on a traffic basis. They, there's a base salary, but then once they hit a certain traffic target, meaning how many, how much traffic they drove to the site based on articles they produce, they get a bonus, all right? So imagine working just the, the mind of someone who has to work that way versus you look at the New York Times or what, you know, uh, Tom is doing at the Marshall Project. When the Times does an investigative report, they will staff two, three, four reporters and, and a few editors for a year maybe on one story or a series of stories about one major important topic. That's incredibly expensive to like not have someone available to you as the editor for a year, two, three reporters just working on something. And so the economics of that have become less viable as newspapers start losing more money. So therefore you have nonprofit projects like the Marshall Project or you know, um, there's a few others out there now that are trying to gain traction but they're funded by foundations, by even public money or, or, or Kickstarter projects and whatnot. And that's ultimately uh, a dangerous thing because if there isn't the economics to support that kind of reporting, there, no one's watching. No one's watching their government. No one's watching what's going on out there. The other last, the, the point I'd sort of tag on to this beyond just the economics of it is, in the surveillance state, and, and and Tom's point is right. Historically speaking, it's always been tough for reporters because, whether it's the police or the government or whomever, major corporation, they're just spying on you. I've I've had as a reporter a number of instances where, especially now a source at a particular company that I'm writing about would forward me an email he got. You know, companies will send company notes or emails or there's a smaller chain of emails. He'll, he or she would, I remember two instances, they just forward me the email from their work account. And I ended up writing a story about it and then the company got upset and they were like, who the hell leaked this? And guess what? All they did was just check the company servers. The company owns the email. So they knew who sent it. They knew who leaked it to me without even my having, you know, no one pressured me, they just, Point is, it's gotten harder. Surveillance has gotten deeper. So being a reporter is that much harder. Not just you know getting anyone to open up to you, but the whole process of trying to gather this information. Because whether it's the government or the police, or or corporations for that matter, they're just looking at everything. And so it's there's less money for reporters for investigative uh, reporting, and it's just harder because of all the surveillance. And, and I don't want to be such a downer about it, but. Those are the stakes. That's the situation. And Ed, how about re how about recode? Recode itself. Okay, so we're a really small operation, and, and I, w I wouldn't be surprised if you guys had heard of us. Um, it actually started a few years ago as a blog out of the Wall Street Journal. It used to be called All Things D, which is the tech section of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and then last year, the the, the two journalists who founded Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher, who are my bosses, basically said, "We're going to do this on our own. We're going to get some investment, and that we're unique in the sense that." We do have advertising, we have traffic concerns, yes, but what drives our business is we have what's called a conference business, right? And so we have access to all the big technology CEOs, whether it's Larry Page at Google or uh, you know the guys over at Apple, they just launched their big Apple Watch yesterday they're talking about. Uh, and what we do is we get them on stage and people come and buy tickets and they you know, get to hear them talk and, and we, we grill them on stage and we ask them questions. We call it live journalism, that's our value proposition. Um, and you know these tickets are expensive, and so there's that's where we make money that way. There are a lot of sponsorships, so that essentially funds the journalism side of it. Of course, there are questions of you know people have, uh, express concerns about well the ethics of you're having people come on, people are paying you to, to 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 watch them, and you're also reporting them at the same time. Yes, that's a good concern. That's a legitimate concern. I, I would hold up all the the reporting we've done on our beats uh, as evidence of our being really fair and tough on the subjects that we cover, the subjects we come to them. Thank you, Ed. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I want to ask a question about tech coverage. And I, I take your point, but I also think there's a real problem of needing access to these companies. And, you know, you can be a nonprofit like ProPublica, but you were started with banking money from the old savings and loan sandlers. There are a lot of contradictions even going to philanthropies and so forth inside, but we now look back on the day of classified ads <laughs> and movie ads as kind of pure, at least you knew what they were up to. Now any rich person can back a blog, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, uh, but you have to wonder what's not being covered. We know the banking crisis was not covered very well by anybody because of these conflicts of interest, but I, I want to take up a specific thing relating to our um, uh, our discussion, and it's discussed in my book, 
That's the role of government agencies, the CIA, uh, in 2005, well, actually much earlier, uh, uh, under the Clinton administration, was the first outcropping of it, formed a venture capital company called InQtel. The CIA is not supposed to be involved in domestic American life. They're not supposed to be spying on us. They're not supposed to be doing anything. Uh, but the CIA formed a, a company called InQtel, which has been provided seed money and counseling and access for hundreds of Silicon Valley companies. One of them is Palantir, a company that for three years had the CIA as its only client. After they perfected their data mining uh, with uh, the CIA, that then they became the data miners for all of our national intelligence agencies, all 16 or 17 of them. They also, we now know from leaks, uh, do the data mining for the Los Angeles Police Department, the New Orleans Police Department. So here you have a privately held Silicon Valley company that mints billionaires, founded by two people uh, from PayPal, and it seems to get almost no coverage. Uh, what does this tell us, that a private for-profit company that's accountable to no one, not even public stockholding, uh, has this enormous power over our data? And most recently, the New York Times Magazine section had an excellent article uh, on one of the co-founders of this company, Joe Lonsdale, who was a PayPal guy, who was banned from the Stanford campus because of improper relation in the view of Stanford with his mentee. And then there was just one paragraph in the article that mentioned, oh, and this fellow Lonsdale is one of the founders and a big owner of this company, Palantir. So he's not trusted to be on the Stanford campus, but he's trusted to have access to our data and all the intelligence agencies. And, and I wonder, why hasn't the you know, tech crunch has done some on this, Forbes has done a little bit on it, uh, but I wonder why hasn't there been more coverage of the complicity of the tech industry, say Google's relationship to DARPA and hiring people from DARPA, the connection between the private sector and the government, going back actually to the origin of the internet as a, as a defense department uh, uh, project. And finally, in my book, I raise this notion of a military intelligence complex to complement President Eisenhower's warning about the military industrial complex. We have a lot of interconnection between the military and Silicon Valley, a very deep connection, and uh, it seems to me not very effectively covered by uh, the tech press. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Excuse is me, there Tom, a, there a uh, one thing to pick up on what Bob said? Uh, after Edward Snowden uh, reported out uh, how the government, uh, the NSA in particular, was getting public information and, and tapping into public communications, uh, he indicated how several major corporations involved with communications was allowing this information to be funneled to the NSA. How much backlash was there for those companies? And what's being done now, you know, through the media and through the public to try to hold them accountable? For Bob primarily, or start with Ed, or anyone Tom? on the committee? I think, well, so I, I'll yeah. sign up for the, I hold, think. Hold on for two sure. seconds. Uh, Bob, did you hear that question? It was from, it was from our director in the back row. I couldn't hear. Okay, the question was, how much backlash was there when companies like Verizon were on the front pages saying they fully cooperated with the uh, NSA or CIA, handing over huge amounts of data uh, that, uh, about what their customers were doing? Is that a fair summary of your question? Yeah, but, uh, and obviously had no right to do that. And, and Ed, Ed from uh, Retech is going to start out with a reply, and then, but you can put that in the, in the back of your mind. Okay, go ahead, Ed. So I mean I think I think uh, Bob makes a fair criticism. I think the tech press in general um, hasn't been that great. Just first of all, covering the industry. Forget about the ties to to government, but just in general, you know, holding the the, the industry's feet to the fire as as companies, as employers, um, and that's largely because you know a lot of I think this is something that both Bob and and Tom touched on earlier. If you're a reporter covering government, or if you're a reporter covering City Hall, or you're a reporter covering Google, for that matter, which is something that I know more firsthand, you develop a relationship with this infrastructure, this this sort of behemoth, big or you know whatever it is that you're covering, uh, and a lot of times they will come to you and leak stuff that they feel is important to get out there, right? Well, don't say it's from us, but you can write something that says X, Y, and Z because they know it's going to make them look good. 
And my reporters always come back to me and say, hey, so they're going to give us an exclusive. This is always what they say. They're going to have to only talk to us. They're not going to tell it to anyone else. This is what it's going to be. And I always push back and I say, all right, that's fine, but let's explain what that is and why that's significant or insignificant. And every once in a while, it's so insignificant, I say, no, we're not going to do that story. So, you know, we, are, we definitely try to apply a lot of skepticism and context and, you know, uh, sort of just a good skeptical eye whenever we're handed things. But there are a lot of, especially tech blogs, that don't do that. They'll just run almost everything. They're, you know, essentially press release uh, mills for the tech industry. And, you know, I think the specific examples that Bob brought up are good ones. Um, and, you know, it's definitely something we are looking more deeply at. I think to tie it back into the question in the back of the room, basically, the reaction to the fact that it's not just the NSA spying on you, but it's the NSA in conjunction with whether it's Verizon or, frankly, Google or Yahoo or Facebook. Now, here's what's interesting, and this is where we've sort of been trying to come into this. Publicly speaking, Google, all the tech companies are basically saying, no, 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 we don't do this. Or once we heard about it, we were upset and tried to close off this backdoor key the NSA had to all our systems. Now, we don't fully believe that. We feel that they must have known or must have cooperated on some level, right? And so a lot of that hasn't been fully reported out yet. We have public statements saying that they're upset about it, and then we also have a few anonymous reports saying, you know, well, they knew about it and they offered backdoor keys. There hasn't been any good evidence. There hasn't been any smoking gun evidence. So that's not to say we're not trying to do that. That's not to say that's not trying to be reported out, whether it's by us or by other major news organizations or even maybe some of the blogs out there. But uh, the, the, the point is the close ties between technology and government and surveillance certainly is something that has to be looked at more deeply not everyone's doing it, not everyone's doing it thoroughly enough, but uh, it is an issue that a lot of newsrooms are aware of and trying to, trying to report out. So. Uh, a follow-up comment on that about uh, some, uh, sort of a lack of outrage about Verizon or Google being in bed with the NSA or CIA gathering this data? Tom, Bob, Jesse? I mean, uh, you know, I think I touched on this point, but uh, almost all of the journalists surveyed uh, for our report believe that no question, the, their ISP, you know, and probably any of these other companies, would share their data with the U.S. government as part of any standard NSA data gathering. You know, almost all believe that it, their ISP would, you know, hand over data if subpoenaed. So we didn't necessarily ask about, you know, their, their attitudes about that, you know, how they felt about that, but there seems to be this almost universal perception among the journalism community that, you know, uh, you know, we're vulnerable here, uh, and I and I can't necessarily count on uh, these uh, you know large utilities to you know protect uh, the security of my communications or my data. Thank you. Okay, um, we have two big parts left: your Q and A, and also Tom wants to walk us through a story that is related about some New York City coverage that he did. So let me just quickly see who has an uh, an itchy arm and wants to throw a question at our panel. Oh, okay. uh, Bob, go yes, ahead. Yeah, I just want one point because Tom mentioned before COINTELPRO. Now, we, we, you know, when I, I started out in journalism, after being in graduate school at Berkeley and after being a city college in New York, by the way, I'm in the Hall of Fame of journalism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I edited the magazine called Ramparts in the 60s. And we, we did some of the first exposés of what the CIA uh, was doing with, with American politics and the FBI and so forth. Uh, and we weren't the only ones. There was good reporting elsewhere. And as a result, you had the church committee. You had new rules of the road. That's why we have a, a FISA court and so forth. And, and uh, it was recognized that even with a much more primitive technology, this was a, a, a major assault. On, on the assumptions of a democratic society, which begin with a citizenry that is not afraid to express itself and is not intimidated, that is empowered to question. That's the whole hope of a representative government uh, that has been denied. But the fact of the matter is, all of the gains of the church committee, all of the uh, things that were put in place at that time have been swept aside in this post 9-11 hysteria. And, and the irony in this is that when Barack Obama was pressed to come up with a single example of how this made us safer, he came up with a fraud. He came up with the case.
case of one of the hijackers in San Diego, Mindar, who was living at the home of an FBI informant, who was well known to the CIA and the FBI, and who in fact, uh, any of his calls could have been easily uh, found out uh, by old-fashioned technology not violating the law. And if you look at the most prominent examples, the Boston Marathon or the Charlie Hebdo magazine massacre in, in Paris, the, the people who are accused of those crimes were well known to the police in Paris. The guy had already served time, and all you needed was an old-fashioned cop to go and knock on his door and find out what they were up to. And, but in the name of making us sacred, they haven't made us sacred. They just they destroy or are destroying our democracy. So that's again something you know. The whole assumption of this is that it was necessary, and it wasn't necessary. There's no evidence to support it. Bob, thank you. Uh, uh, that, that brings to mind one thing as, as we open it up to who has the uh, most, the biggest spasm in their arm, and we'll raise it up and ask a question. And that is the tools that you guys might need to be ready to use. When you walk into a newsroom as an intern or a brand new reporter or a production assistant at a radio or TV network, uh, you might need to use some basic encryption. I don't want to sound like I'm paranoid and the government is snooping. Another book reference, Bob, thank you. Uh, but it looks like they are getting. Uh, it, it looks like it's a reality, and your your bosses might bring that up right away. Now, uh, out of the guests we have right now in front of us, who is using any? Who's had to? Is on a regular basis or for very sensitive stories using a tool like that, basic encryption for sensitive stuff. If you're, if you're reporting on the government, anybody or do I might kind of go ahead, Ed. I mean, I, I've used PGP encryption for years, but not for not consistently, not for most of the stuff. PGP, stuff that we're okay. Can you explain that? So uh, just a it's bit? just it's just a way to encrypt communications, typically your email. Uh, they're, it's they're free keys that you can create. It creates two sets of keys. And a key is a password. It's basically a password. It's a long string of letters and numbers that you'll never remember by yourself, so you just have to hold on to it. Um, and there's one that you hold, and there's one that you hand out. Right? Uh, there's two sets of basically string of letters and numbers. The ones you hand out is the token you give to people to be like, okay, when do you want to send me an email, use this key. I'm not going to get into the weeds on that, but basically uh, it's a fairly straightforward way for someone to encrypt an email, send it to you, and then only you can read it with your other key, right? The other string of, of, of letters and numbers. Uh, I think there's a lot of websites, if you just search for it, you'll, you'll find ways to do that. I don't know, frankly, how secure that is relative to like what the NSA can do. My presumption, it, when I ever, whenever I communicate what I think is going to be super sensitive, my presumption is if I'm doing it electronically, someone will find out. I always presume that's the case, no matter what. No matter how strong of encryption you think you've got, how powerful computers you might you know, think you're using, the presumption should be someone is going to find out. So what I always do is I try to meet people in person. Not just because I think it's safer, um, but ultimately you just get a better story that way. You, you just get better information that way. Not always, not necessarily, but it's a way for you to connect with your source in a way that you otherwise never could. Underline you know? that, that was, that's a terrific advice, thank you. And I tell that to all my reporters, like as often as you can, meet people in person, because that's also part of the fun of being a journalist. I mean, hell, it's like you get to sit down and talk to people, have a drink, have lunch, find out about their lives, you know, whatever it is, like that's part of the fun. If you don't do that, you're not really doing it. Thank you, a uh, follow-up question? Let's uh, comment. Let's let's move on to those two big parts. Who has the itch? Who's going to raise their hand and throw a quick question out there? Uh, the uh, does anybody see themselves possibly going to New York One or Queens Chronicle and saying, actually, this is not James Bond stuff, but you might need to use encryption uh, for the emails you're about to send back and forth. Has that ever crossed your minds? Anybody? It's it's it's. Uh, this is what, I, again, I watch too many Snowden uh, documentaries, and I watch the documentary, which I want to screen as soon as our talk is over. It's on the web. I want to screen it as soon as this talk is over. Um, and he had to explain it to the document, the documentarian who we wanted to con contact to get a story out. He had to explain it and argue her into using encryption, and he didn't have to argue as, and he also had to argue with Glenn Greenwald, uh, because he wasn't that into it either. So it's pretty new. It's pretty new, and he had to get them, he had to walk them through it a little bit, not so much for the filmmaker. Okay, I digress. But um, I asked that question about technology, but, li but listen, listen closely to what Ed said about just meet people face to face, and you can, look, you can look up how that was done in Watergate in a parking garage. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, introduce yourself, Ashley, please. Hi, I'm Ashley Oliver. I'm a sophomore journalism major. And I just wanted to know, is it legal to encrypt, because I'm, in, I'm interested in investigative journalism, but is it legal? Are there any like ethical 
uh, violations that we'll be causing. Like if we encrypt, then who do we know how to encrypt? Like who to encrypt? Well, did you hear that? The question was, uh, what, what are the are there, are there ethical issues? Are there legal issues about encryption from one of the students? Do you want to tackle it? No, I've talked enough. Oh, oh Ed. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. I mean, as far as I know, there's nothing illegal or 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 unethical about encrypting encrypting communication, so long as you know, it's ultimately just down to you and whomever you're speaking to. You know, uh, and. The presumption is that the, the conversation is private and you know you want to at least clear that off with your source first and chances are the source is already presuming that anyway. Um, so there's nothing to say wrong with that. There, there have been issues just uh, a more sort of nuts and bolts issue in terms of recording conversations. You know it used to be uh, we're in New York State so we have just the one person rule. So as long as one party to the conversation is aware that it's being recorded, you're fine. Uh, so other states, both parties have to be aware that you're recording a conversation. I always sort of let my source know, whoever it is, just so you know, I'm recording this, right? Um, and they'll be like, well, okay, I just, I don't want this to be on the record. I'm like, this is my own notes. Uh, and if there's anything you're really concerned about, I'll make it, I'll flag it, don't worry about it. So as long as you're just being upfront with whoever you're talking to. But encryption is just a safeguard for both you and the source. It's equivalent to, I don't know, meeting in a quiet, uh, place somewhere where no one, no one else can hear you. So there's nothing illegal about that either, right? I hope that, help, that helps help. If some of those uh, Snowden shows that have been watching as my blood pressure went up, it said, well, look, you can use these tools, but you got to realize the government can make like a billion guesses a minute to crack your password. Something like that, some number like that. So what Ed said is right. Nothing really, really is locked down uh, yeah. 100%. Please introduce yourself. Oh, hi, um, my name is Cynthia Drani. I just wanted to um, add a question to what you said, that as long as one person knows that you're recording, you can record. What if the person says that they don't want you to record? Can you record? Well, no, so then you have to respect their wishes, okay. you know, for, for whatever reason. I mean, you know, you ultimately with your sources, you're trying to build trust, right? If you're lying to them, that's not cool, right? You don't want to do that. Yeah, the that same way they don't, you don't want them to lie to you. And here's the thing is that just because a source is talking to you off record doesn't mean they're not lying either. Remember that, right? That's that's the that's the parlor game. That's the trick. That's the challenge, uh, in terms of fair. And that's why always meeting face to face is always better. You, you know, you got to feel them out. You know, look at their face. How are they reacting? All that stuff. Uh, I'm Ashley Martin. I'm also a journalism major and student. Um, in terms of recording, how secure do you think that is? Like, if you record and you save it to your phone, is there a way that they can? No, it's a great question. I mean, again, it's like if it's electronic, they're gonna get it, right? <laughs> so. Um, it's not when you, when you meet, sorry, like when you meet in person, do you just write everything down as opposed to recording it? I do both, right? I will take hand notes. I'm kind of old school that way. That's what all reporters should do. You have a reporter's notebook, and they have to fit in the palm of your hand. They're they're long and skinny like that, right? They're they're like that for a reason. So yeah. you could fit them in the palm of your hand. But I also have a tape recorder as well. I mean, now I, I actually just use my you phone. In the same hand phone. is the classic technique. Right, exactly right. So that's just how that goes. And, you know, uh, yeah, I save my notes digitally. Ultimately, I save my recordings digitally. Yes, if they want, they're going to get it. I mean, at the end of the day, remember, it's like, you know, unless you're trying to hunt down NSA operatives doing what, there's a probably a good chance no one's not trying to break into your files, <laughs> yeah. per se. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's ultimately about protecting your sources as well, right? You don't want to be in a situation where, you know, your source, your your source is outed because you were you're doing things in an insecure way. You know, that means leaving your notes lying around, sending emails to other people about who your source is. You don't want to do that either. I think that is a more sort of um, uh, 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 a regular everyday pitfall. A lot of times within my staff, reporters will hey, so so-and-so just told me this, right? And they'll send me an email. And I said, is this your source? And they'll be like, yes. I'm like, don't email that to me. <laughs> so I'll say, call me up. Tell me who you're talking to. I still need to know who your source is, right? I still need to feel them. I still need to vet your source. But if you're emailing me all this information, you're texting it to me, blah, 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 that's like not, that's not safe. So those are the things you have to be more concerned about than necessarily encrypting every little thing. I mean, that, that's only going to get you so far, and it ends up being more hassle. So, thank you. Um, I have a, a technical issue. Uh, Bob, you can still hear us, right? 
Yeah. Good. Okay. Can I make a point about that, by the way? Sure. Hello? Absolutely. Go right ahead. Yeah. You know, uh, this is interesting. We, we would, should be having this discussion if we were in the old Soviet Union or East Germany under the Stasi. But, but we're supposed to be in a society that values freedom. We've trumpeted this to the whole world. And so this assumption that we have to make now that our work habits, our conversations, everything is fair game for the government that we're supposed to be observing is something uh, you need to challenge. Yes, we have to use encryption, but why do we have to use encryption? Okay, I would ask that question of Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton blasted Edward Snowden as a traitor for telling us what our government does to us. You would think that was his obligation as an American citizen to tell us what our government is doing when it's breaking the law. Yet, you know, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, all these people that, that you know, and plenty of Republicans have denounced the whistleblowers. They've defended this culture of intimidation. So the, I would put the question differently. I would, I would ask Hillary Clinton, why did, were you part of a government that created an atmosphere in which reporters have to be frightened and, and worried about their sources and have to be acting as if they're in a totalitarian society encrypting their email? How did we come to this pass? And how do you justify it? And how are we supposed to hold you accountable when you won't let us have the basic information, including, in Hillary's case, uh, you know, your emails that you were supposed to be running on a public uh, server that went through the State Department. So I would turn this around, not put the question to the journalists, saying, why do you have to do these extraordinary uh, methods to protect yourself, which we do, but who put us into this position? It's the people who claim that they believed in a free society, in, in a separation of powers, and limited government. What happened to them? Thank you. Uh, I saw one more hand, and then we're going to switch to Tom, because he has a good example. Hi, my name is Brianne Kenlock. I'm a freshman here. I mean, this question, this would actually go to anyone, any one of you. Um, do you think it's ironic that internet restrictions such as SOPA, PIPA, and ACTA that would be enforced by the government if they actually, you know, succeed in passing it would completely restrict our freedom to see what we want and look out and hook and hear what we want, and yet we are not allowed to basically do our own thing without any fear of reproach. Can you tell us about uh, your internet uh, abbreviations you just used? Uh, SOPA, PICPA, and ACTA were supposed to be, um, it, it was back then, 2012, 2013, I guess. Uh, there was a, basically, um, the government wanted to restrict any, basically act in any specific uh, information Basically, like Wikipedia or anything that you search on Google, like any websites, and many people, I mean, world, I mean, nationwide, basically protested this by, black, by um, blacking over, you know, and some of their um, some of their pages, some of their websites as a form of protest. And so, so people not to would come. I mean, if they ever went you know, to be uh, accepted as a law, internet res internet uh, restriction would be very, very high. Not only for journalists, but for society as a whole. And I find this very ironic, since you're, you want to look at our information and what we do, but yet yeah, we're not allowed to do what we want to do as citizens. Is, this is very, don't you think that this is very, very ironic? As so I think the specific issues that you're bringing up have to do, so SOPA, for example, has, so the, the backstory to that particular piece of legislation is there are the internet companies that, that sort of deliver content to you, whether it's Google or Facebook or Twitter or what have you, and then there are the actual content creators. Uh, and in this case, content creators are the sort of the traditional like movie studios and, and music labels, and they were concerned that their copyrighted content was being essentially ripped off and with the aid of Google and face all these sort of easy distribution platforms. And so they lobbied Congress to help them pass a law that would allow them to forbid the illegal transmission, the illegal distribution of copyrighted content. 
Viacom, which you know you probably watch like MTV or, or Nickelodeon or go to movies, Paramount movies. Viacom owns all this content. They created it. A lot of it ended up on YouTube. This is you know 10, 15 years ago, of course, and they decided we're going to sue YouTube. And like 10, 15 years later, finally they won their suit, right? Uh, but of course, in practice, that had long passed. Where basically Google said, "Fine, anytime we find copyrighted material on YouTube, we will take it down." You know, we will do that for you, don't worry. And they do that for everybody. So the thing is, SOPA was a way for not just Viacom, but other content companies to basically find a baseline protection so that my stuff isn't illegally distributed. And that's what, and of course, Facebook and Google, these guys sort of interpreted that legislation differently, saying you're trying to, you're trying to you know, uh, suppress information that we want people to be able to see. And so, in theory, that is a good thing to fight for. But in practice, with, this, with that particular piece of legislation, there was a lot of backroom politicking that had nothing to do with necessarily freedom of information, had everything to do with money. So it's a good question. I, I, just, I think that there's a, a, another level there that uh, doesn't always get explained, frankly, in the news reporting. Thank you. And it's um, uh, something Privacy Act? Yeah. I forget. Uh, There's so much alphabet soup. There's a great question, yeah. and I hope everybody started to, can start to tune into that kind of issue for uh, for freedom of information and, and you trying to do stories. Uh, I can't remember what so SOPA stands for, though. Okay, uh, we'll Google it later. Uh, now, uh, so Tom Robbins is up next with an example that he brought along. I hit one button behind you, and, and the floor is yours. Uh, go ahead. Oh, get a bus yeah, over here. Yeah, right here. We'll put the uh, the uh, good. You're ready. A New York City example of some reporting he did and uh, government information. Well, it's, it's not, it's not yeah. really, I mean, it's a story about the thing that I've run into. I mean, in my, in my years, I haven't been so much worried about them spying on me, which as I told you I've run into a big one. It's about them lying to me. That's the thing that really worries me all the time. So I just thought when, when, when Glenn and Tom asked me to come out here and talk about it, I thought maybe I'd walk you through a story that I did just before I left the Village Voice uh, in early 2011, which had to do with this training movie that I was told by a police officer friend of mine, and this guy wasn't a big, high and mighty detective, he was just a grunt, he was a patrolman who I happened to know, and he came to me and said, you know, we were just sent for our regular training on counterterrorism, which is something that all cops go through now. And they have to go down to this place down in Coney Island in Brooklyn and they have to sit through some seminars. And he said, we were shown this movie. And he said, the movie was the most lurid, anti-Muslim thing you can imagine. And he was so upset about it, he had actually ordered a copy of it on Amazon and brought it for me. And he said, watch this and tell me if you think this is the kind of thing that police officers in New York City should be watching. And I, so I did, I watched it. And it was amazing. <laughs> it was it was called uh, The Third Jihad, and it was basically premised on the idea that Muslims had been waging a centuries-old battle to take over the world, and they were at work right now in America doing that. And that virtually every Muslim organization that posed itself as just a bunch of citizens was effectively a front for uh, a jihad. So after I watched it, I thought, well, this is pretty strange stuff. I can't believe that this really happened. So. I, I did a couple of things. One was I called up some folks I knew who worked with one of those organizations that had been described actually in the movie, this CARE, it's called Coalition of Arab Islamic Relations, I think, and asked them if they'd heard of them. And the, new, the local guy in New York, a guy named Zayd Ramadan, told me that in fact, yeah, a cop who was Arab American, or a Muslim American had come to him and said, yeah, we, had, we saw this movie, and he had gone to Ray Kelly. This guy had been at a thing at Gracie Mansion, and he had gone to Ray Kelly, the then police commissioner, and said, you know, there's this really disturbing movie I heard about that's getting shown. And Kelly said, he nodded, and he said, I'll, I'll look into that, I'll look into that. So, I then called up what's called DCPI, that's the Deputy Commissioner for Public Information at the It's New the worst. Police <laughs> Department. <laughs> it's the worst. It's the worst. Just to abbreviate a DCPI at 1PP, and then you're a real journalist. It's, it's, well, I, the re, I think the reason Ed's saying it's the worst is because they, they tend to be very reluctant to answer any questions, and as, as you'll see in this these are uniform. Thing. These are uniform police officers answering the phone. Do you think they want to talk to a reporter and tell you anything? 
All right, I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> so I, so anyway, so I, so I called up, and there is a, there's a fellow there who actually used to work at the Daily News with me and Claire, a guy named Paul Brown, who was the chief of DCPI, and I asked Paul Brown about this movie. Did you anybody see that? And he said, well, you know, yeah, I heard something about it. It's really wacky, and it never should have been shown. But he insisted that the cops never saw it. He said it was reviewed by my people and was found to be inappropriate. So I said, well, you know, I don't know. I talked to this one cop, and he said he saw it. And I spoke to Zaid Ramadan from CARE, and he said he's heard from another cop that he saw it. Paul, would you mind going back and checking again? Right? So follow-up call, he didn't call me back, but I called him back mm -hmm. a day or so later. And he said, well, you know what? My information is that the third jihad was actually shown a couple of times when officers were filling out paperwork before the actual coursework began. <laughs> so I said, all right, you know, I, 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 I can look at that. It was another question that I had for him, which had to do with the fact that in that movie, Ray Kelly, the police commissioner, is interviewed. And it looked pretty, you know, professional. I mean, he's sitting in a room with some books behind him, and he's sitting in a chair, he looks pretty comfortable, he went out at some length, there's a lot of different people interviewed in the movie, but I thought it was interesting, the police commissioner, so I asked Paul Brown if Kelly had sat for an interview for this movie. And he said, no, the phrase that he used, he thought the footage had been scraped from another source. A term of quasi-art that's now used universally to describe, you know what I mean. I mean, you pick something up somewhere else in the cyberspace and you import it into what you've got. So he said, no. That was straight. We never did that. So I left the voice at that point. I went to work for a much nicer place, the City University of New York. <laughs> Fast forward a year later, one year later, I have a friend who works at the New York Times. His name is Michael Powell. And he called me up and he said, I am revisiting an old story of yours. It's really, which one is that? And he says, it's about that movie. And I said, well, Michael, you're just eating my dust. I reported that movie a year ago. And he said, I have new information. I said, what would that do? He said, the information is that someone filed a freedom of information request. A FOIL in New York. It's a FOIL. Outside, it's a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act in New York. And they had, they had gotten the information that, unlike what Paul Brown had told me, it was not just shown to a couple of people. It was shown on a, quote, continuous loop. That comes out of a police memo. 1,489 police officers, from lieutenants to detectives to patrol officers, had seen the film. So here I am a year earlier, I, you know, I had called up twice the Deputy Commissioner of Public Information, the top guy, a former reporter, and he twice told me, it's just, first that nobody saw it, and then only a couple saw it. By the so, way, did they, did the Times link to your story there? They certainly did. That's right important. <laughs> That's important. You gotta fight for that link, you, you know, okay. Not only that, he had my Hyperlink. Baby, <laughs> and then he also put the same question to Brown that I had put, which was, since Kelly is listed as a featured interviewee, did Kelly sit for an interview? And again, the answer was, they had lifted the clip from an old interview. And no, they had not asked for it to be reported. Well, that story lasted exactly 24 hours. That previous story was January 23rd. This is January 24th. I forget if this one made the front page or not. I don't think it did. The first one was actually on the front page at the time. But here's Michael's follow-up. Through a top A, Raymond Kelly acknowledges the first time he personally cooperated with the filmmakers of Third Jihad. He now describes it as a mistake. And the reason that Michael knew that was because he got an email from the guys who made the movie who described that Kelly had sat for a 90-minute interview in his office at police headquarters, and he had the date, March 19, 2007. <laughs> this is the police commissioner of New York City, folks. This is a guy who had higher approval ratings than Mayor Bloom. You know, to this day, probably, if he wanted to run for mayor, he'd have a decent shot. Brown said to Michael, he said, he's right. In fact, I recommended in February 2007 that Commissioner Kelly be interviewed. <laughs> Shoot me twice. <laughs> so I've been talking to Paul Brown a year before that. He said, not only was it scraped from another source, it never got shown. All that was, all that was untrue. No explanations offered. 
So I, I offer that as an explanation, just as saying that like I think your first problem, how many people want to be reporters here? How many people look at the reporters? All right, you're all crazy. But <laughs> that said, that said, it is the best job you can ever have for exactly the reason that Ed just said, because you get paid to talk to people. And if you like talking to people, it's the greatest job in the world. You don't have to sell them anything. You don't have to sell them insurance or religion or anything like that. You just have to talk to people and then write about it. It's a wonderful, wonderful job. And it's true, as Bob Shear was saying, it's very difficult to make a living at it, but it's still a great job. And things like this, I think, make it great. This is the Freedom of Information request. You can barely see it. I'm sorry. I scraped this from another source. <laughs> from the, the wonderful institution called the Brennan Center for Justice. They had seen my story back then. And you can see the date on this is April 1st, 2011. They submitted, and I commend you to go to their website. You can look at the chain. If you're interested in like, how do secrets get exposed, go to the Brennan Center for Justice website and link it to the third jihad and look at their various freedoms. They had to appeal it many times to get it. They finally got it. And here's the memo that they got. Dated March 23rd, 2011. Right? My story came out two months earlier in January. And one of the things that I thought was interesting about this is a memo which to the command from, to the deputy commissioner for training, which is not Paul Brown, that's somebody else. I'm not, I don't remember the name who it was at the time. But he says, per your direction, this report summarizes the circumstances surrounding the unauthorized presentation of the video, the third year. Uh, quote, yeah, I'm get for why it's unauthorized, but they're mm -hmm. getting that word right now. On or about January 21st, 2011, Inquiries were received at the police academy from Deputy Commissioner of Public Information Paul Brown. He dropped the E and he spelled it about the third. So I thought well, that's interesting because I just go back to, I like that story. Oh, January 19th. And he's already being quoted to me that he's made two inquiries about this. <laughs> According to their own memo, he didn't get around to asking until two days later after the story appeared. So you rarely get, you know, those of you who will go into journalism, you'll rarely get this kind of, you know, blatant lying. I'm not saying it goes on all the time, but it does go on sometimes. And the, the watchword is simply, you know, checking facts and asking the question. Sometimes if the answer doesn't sound believable, to ask it more than once. Are you sure? As I said to Paul Brown when he denied it completely to me, are you sure? Right? So, we're all getting spied on. You know, I can't do anything about that. I'll have to learn encryption. I've never done it, but I'll, I'll try to learn how to do it. But I do know that there's ways to prevent yourself from being completely lied to and misled if you do your homework. I didn't file the Freedom Information Request. The Brennan Center did. But if not for their filing that, that lie would have lived forever. So that was the lesson that I just thought I would impart to all you budding journalists before I did it all. You should also, every time you talk to anyone, a source or a communications person, should always be thinking in the back of your head, why are they lying to me? Why are you lying to me? And if you want, you can ask them straight to their face, why are you lying to me? <laughs> See what they say. Q&A, a, a follow-up on, on Tom's example. Uh, uh, Bob, Bob, go ahead. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to, on SOAP, you know, Stop Internet Privacy Act, and, and Piper, just another bill that was listening us, the significance of that was that the copyright people were pushing through legislation that would made it difficult to use the internet as a free reeling source of information. So the pushback from Google and others was important, uh, not to protect their profit, but they were saying this internet, which we have, is, is vital because the whole world can use it to get access to information. They don't have to go to the Brennan Center, they could probably access the Brennan Center online. They could access the New York Public Library online. And if you want a good documentary on that, the internet's own boy, Aaron Schwartz, who committed suicide because the government went out to destroy him for trying to breathe life into the internet. Brian Nackenberg's excellent documentary is what you should watch. I also want to give a plug for the city college system. Uh, when I went to this Hall of Fame dinner, uh, they listed all of the people, the thousands of great journalists that have come out of the City College system, and it occurred to me uh, uh, that, that it is probably the major institution in the United States for producing great journalists. And I think that has 
has a lot to do with having to get on the subway, having to live in a complex city full of class divisions, racial issues, and so forth. So I just want to uh, say the great thing about journalism is you don't have to be going to Harvard or something. Uh, and I think that we can put the City College record up against any university in the country, including the one that I happen to teach at, have been teaching at for the next 20 years. So that's my pitch. Good one. Uh, thank you, Bob. Picking out here, uh, the boss Lewis is a is a city city uh, a CUNY grad, um, so I'll salute my own boss. Okay. <laughs> uh, now Q and A, let's squeeze a few more questions in because we're running out of time right now. Uh, Mr. Computer says 1:48, so if you have to run to a two o'clock class, uh, I understand there'll be a small exodus now. But please, one or two more questions for our guests before we wrap it up. Uh, after the uh, after the formal session ends in about five minutes, I'll get ready and we'll screen the. Oscar-winning documentary about Snowden and these issues called Citizen Four. Questions, please. Please uh, tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm Gabriel. Uh, I'm a sophomore here. And I was just wondering, actually, going back to your story, uh, your article, you were saying how uh, the third uh, jihad was filmed, what, 2011? So the police... I don't know where it was filmed, but that's what it was shown to Caps in late 2010. Okay. I, think was, I think they made it like a year or so early. All right, so I was just wondering whether or not it was pulled, or is it still being shown? Why don't you report that out? Yes. I was told, they told me that it wasn't being shown anymore, but if you can see right. the credibility level is not great, why don't you give me that Everybody assignment? lines me, I don't know Find what's believe. <laughs> good question, good, good follow-up. Um, and uh, where, oh yeah, yes, please. Um, Iqbal, yeah, tell us who you are. Iqbal Hussain, I'm a journalism major. Um, Edward Snowden did a recent AMA on Reddit about two weeks ago. And he mentioned that he wished he came out with the information a lot earlier because now that it's more entrenched in the government and it's hard to remove these powers from the government once it's passed. So now, with like the issues that we have now with like ISIS and the international like affairs and stuff like that, sometimes this issue gets kind of swept up, you know, underneath the rug. It's not as you know out there. So with the 2016 presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton's not going to be. Um, as like vocal about this issue, I would say, and now there's Congress. How is it on journalists and citizens to raise this issue on like a national level? Because I mean, it's it's a national issue, yes, but it gets swept underneath the rug so much. Like people don't really talk about it unless a new story about it comes out, like the the SIM card hacking of Giamalto, I believe that happened like what just like six six seven months ago. That report came out, so like new things are coming out, but it's always a new story until it's like back into the national national news, so how do we... The run? concern is high according to the survey, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. It's not meat and potato news that people are gonna read about, like, give me an example of a real, like, uh, a, a juicy story people are gonna love to read. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm failing to come up with an example, but I think you're right, good example. And uh, among our guests, who wants to go first on that? Well, uh, you know, we surveyed the U.S. public shortly after the Snowden revelations came out. And you know, you've got this tension between you know, the balance between what the government is trying to do uh, for national security reasons and you know breaches of privacy. On the other hand, you know when you ask, when we asked the public, there was more concern over what the government was doing in terms of overreach than there was concern about the national security interests. That was shortly after the Snowden revelations. Since then, we've polled on that question again, and it kind of it's kind of gone the other way. Uh, so, you know, it kind of suggests that, you know, the, the Snowden revelations, they were a big bang, it left a lot of impact, but over time, at least among the general public, uh, you start to see, you know, some of those concerns about surveillance, about privacy issues start to get, you know, sort of tucked under and more concerned about national security. So uh, that's one of those things that happens, you know, uh, speaking to the point about, you know, it, it's not always something that's on the top of the public's mind. Uh, it's not one of those sort of issues like the economy, and uh, you know it has the potential to sort of get sidelined, you know, in terms of the public's attitudes and, but and concerns. But do you think that that would be also responsible because the current events with the publicity about ISIS? Oh yeah, it's all of, you know using also the same technology. Mm -hmm. By the way, I mean, the point is that the public can be kind of fickle on these issues. But I, I, I mean, I think. Can I put it back at you for a minute? So let's say you were at the press conference, right? And Hillary Clinton's there. And you're just like trying to get her. I mean, 
it is a difficult question to get your arms around. What was the question you would want her to answer about it? I mean, most, and, you know, remember, it's tough to ask good questions. What, what would you ask her? Um, how, well, so all this started with the, you know, after 9-11 with the Patriot Act. So the, that way we, like, you know, gave the ability to collect, like, metadata on all of us, pretty much. So why wasn't, why isn't it a hot, like, topic issue for her to, like... No, no, you're oh, asking her a right, question. Asking her you're question. almost there. You're halfway there. Keep going. Um, to... Um, well, you know what? You're not alone in struggling for that. <laughs> I think that's part of the problem, is that the press has a hard time formulating the question. Bob Shear, how would you ask the question? I would ask Hillary Clinton, when did you know about torture, and why did you and your administration delay the Feinstein Intelligence Committee from returning over their investigation to the public? That would be the first question I would ask Hillary Clinton. On surveillance, I would ask Hillary Clinton, when did you know that you were collecting data on all Americans and doing a degree of spying on all Americans that was released? by Snowden, why didn't you tell us? Why did it remain for Snowden to tell us? And then why do you call him a traitor for telling us? That's an well, excellent point, because like so many stories, including yours, is based on timeline, and establishing a timeline first for when things happen. And clarity in the news very often is dependent on establishing a clear timeline for how the story unfolds. And that's exactly the, in Tom's example of the story that he reported out, right, yeah. in terms of based on when he asked the question and what the answer he was given. And then later we found out, actually, he didn't even ask about it until two days later. And in fact, it was he was the guy who, who recommended the uh, police commissioner participate. So timeline is an important way to uh, uh, sort of get it. I, to answer your question ultimately about like how do we get this make make this an issue, your reporters like what you report out becomes the issue or can become the issue. That's how that's the influence you can have as reporters, right? Instead of just saying oh people should talk about it, if you report things out, people will talk about it. That's your power as a reporter. Thank you. We're gonna have to leave it there. Bring those questions up right now. Come on up and say hello. We're not gonna be able to take any longer because I want people to go to class at two. If our guests can stick around, great. But I'd like to uh, say thank you to our guests. And then Glenn has a quick comment. Jesse Holcomb from Pew and Ed Lee from uh, Recode. Tom Robbins from the CUNY J School. And on the big screen, Bob Shields.